Human Sigma, Managing the Employee-Customer Encounter, was written by John H. Fleming, Ph.D., and Jim Asplund. John Fleming is a principal of Gallup and chief scientist for Gallup's customer engagement and Human Sigma practices. Prior to joining Gallup, Fleming spent six years as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. He received his doctorate in social psychology from Princeton University. Jim Asplund is a principal of Gallup and chief scientist for strengths-based development. Prior to joining Gallup, Asplund spent eight years as a policy expert and lobbyist at the Minnesota legislature. Arnold Schwarzenegger fans will recall the harrowing image from the apocalyptic opening scene of The Terminator. It's the year of darkness, 2029. The machines, created by an advanced form of artificial intelligence called Skynet that accidentally become self-aware, have concluded that they must erase humans from the face of the planet, replacing them with predictable but unfeeling, efficient, and relentless copies of themselves. In essence, the machines are the polar opposite of the humans they seek to destroy. It's a grim scene, and the implications are clear. The machines have decided that humans are not only unnecessary, but they are expendable. They have no value in the vision of the future the machines seek to create. Terminator management is an institutionalized mindset that views people, customers, and employees as a necessary evil, a nuisance, or, in extreme cases, as adversaries in doing business. Rather than viewing people as the reason a business exists, the Terminator School of Management views them as impediments to business that breed inefficiency, cost, and errors. Terminator management sees employees as little more than a cost it needs to reduce or a mistake just waiting to happen. This summary offers a new set of rules and a different way of thinking about managing your company's complex human systems, which can serve as an antidote to Terminator management. It's about a model and an approach called Human Sigma. Human Sigma offers a disciplined approach to measuring, managing, and improving the performance of your most volatile and valuable assets, your customers and employees, to drive financial performance. The accounting and financial reporting systems modern businesses use have failed to keep up with the changing nature of value creation. By focusing on tangible assets, current accounting systems implicitly undervalue human contributions to the enterprise which are primarily intangible things such as creative branding strategies, research and development, and labor productivity. A recent study revealed that an estimated 80% of the market value of the average S&P 500 company is made up of its intangible assets, the company's brand, its customer base and levels of engagement, the talent of employees and innovation and R&D, just to name a few of the most crucial elements. Though most executives recognize the importance of these intangible assets, it's much more difficult to justify investing in them without an accepted means of accounting for the success or failure of these investments. Experts have formulated an approach to measuring and managing human systems that they call Human Sigma. Human Sigma, like its namesake Six Sigma, builds on the best principles of that methodology, offering a strategy for optimizing business performance by reducing variability and improving performance on key indicators. The beauty and simplicity of Six Sigma is that it integrates a universal and consistent method to count quality defects with a disciplined process to eliminate them. The Human Sigma model overlays these same basic process elements onto the human systems of your business by providing a consistent method to assess and monitor the effectiveness of the employee-customer encounter with a disciplined process to manage and improve it. Your Vital Signs the outward indicators of those invisible and mysterious internal processes serve an important function. When your physician measures your blood pressure, heart rate, and respiration, he or she is looking for early signs that something may be amiss. In most cases, your vital signs will register within normal limits, indicating that your body is functioning more or less optimally. Occasionally, however, vital signs yield results that are outside of normal limits. When this happens, they give your physician a warning that your physical systems are out of alignment 
and may be in distress. Just like your regular visits to the physician, an organization requires a feedback system to evaluate, regulate, and maintain its overall health. And just like you, organizations have vital signs that need to be regularly monitored. An organization's vital signs serve as diagnostic indicators of how effectively it's addressing its key constituencies, executing its strategies, maintaining its economic viability, and how likely it is to grow. If heart rate, respiration, and blood pressure are the vital signs of the human organism, then in sales and service organizations, the corresponding vital signs of the employee-customer encounter are the health of its human systems, its customer relationships, employee relationships, and overall financial viability. Separately, these vital signs provide important but incomplete diagnostic information about how effective the organization's employee-customer encounter is. This brings us to the first new rule of human sigma management. Rule 1. E pluribus unum. You can't measure and manage employee and customer experiences as separate entities. They must be managed together under a single organizational entity. Only when these organizational systems and their vital signs are brought together and empirically linked can a true picture of the health of the employee-customer encounter be understood and managed. What this means in practice is that the responsibility for measuring and monitoring the health of a company's employee and customer constituencies should reside within a single organizational structure. This structure should have a clearly identified champion who has the authority to manage change across the broad range of organizational activities that affect the employee-customer encounter. In the employee-customer encounter, one of the most intriguing factors that can significantly affect customers' and employees' perceptions of the world around them is their emotions. We can sum this all up with the second new rule of human sigma management, Rule 2. Feelings are facts, and emotions frame the employee-customer encounter. Studies reveal that engaging customers on an emotional level has a significant financial benefit. There are four key dimensions to a customer's emotional attachment to a company. Each dimension represents a specific set of activities that meet customers' emotional needs. The first and foundational dimension of emotional attachment is confidence. Is the company trustworthy? But confidence alone is not enough to build long-term, sustainable, and emotionally connected customer relationships. Beyond confidence lies integrity, the essential dimension of fair play. Does this company treat me the way I deserve to be treated? If something goes awry, can I count on this company to fix it quickly? The next emotional requirement is pride, a sense of positive association and identification with the company. Pride goes beyond simplistic notions of self-representational status or badge qualities of association to deeper levels of shared values between the customer and the company. Customers who feel pride are proud to be a customer not because of what their association with a company says to others, but more importantly, because of what it says to them about themselves. Customers' associations with companies not only convey information about them to others, but they also help define and sharpen their own self-concepts. The fourth dimension, and the ultimate expression of emotional attachment, is passion. A passionate customer describes his or her relationship with the company as irreplaceable and a perfect fit for him or her. Passionate customers are rare, but they represent the epitome of customer connectedness. They are customers for life and are worth their weight in gold. The foundational dimension of emotional attachment, confidence, is also the most basic. Will this company deliver on its promises day in and day out? Confidence is the bedrock upon which higher levels of emotional attachment are built. But confidence alone is not enough to build long-term, sustainable, and emotionally connected customer relationships. It's only the starting point for an emotional connection. A company's ability to engender confidence in its customers begins with its ability to consistently deliver a customer's basic requirements for that industry and more specific elements of the company's brand promise. Gallup's research has shown that companies that fail to build confidence have a much tougher time engaging customers than companies in which customer confidence is solid. For customers, the consistency between what a company promises and what it actually delivers is key to building confidence. What are a company's standards? 
What ethics does it live by? Will it treat all its customers fairly, following through on a promise even if doing so costs the firm money in the short term? Does it play by the rules? Does it treat me the way I want to be treated? These are some of the questions that illuminate the second level of emotional attachment, integrity, the essential dimension of equitable treatment. Social psychological literature identifies at least three different types of fairness or justice. Distributive fairness, which addresses how resources are distributed. Procedural fairness, which covers the processes and systems that are used to determine how resources are allocated. And interactional fairness, which encompasses how people are treated at an individual level. All three types of fairness come into play at different times, and all are important. However, from a customer's perspective, distributive and procedural fairness carry the greatest weight because they represent chronic or structural issues. Customers' perceptions of transactional fairness, in contrast, can vary from interaction to interaction and therefore represent transient or acute issues. With distributive fairness, three rules are possible equity, equality, and need. Fair treatment under the equity rule means that the company should reciprocate and distribute resources based on what I have invested in the relationship. In contrast, fair treatment under the equality rule means that a company should distribute resources equally among all customers, or treat me the way you treat all other customers. Finally, fair treatment under the need rule means that the company should distribute resources to me based on my individual needs, or treat me like no other customer. Procedural fairness covers whether customers feel that your company's policies and procedures are fair and equitable. The search for customer centricity is really a search for procedural fairness. A company that customers see as taking advantage of them or as designing policies and procedures that customers view as inequitable will quickly erode its customer engagement. Pride functions on multiple levels. The power of the pride dimension is not just what doing business with a particular company tells others about me, it's what being a customer tells me about me. The fourth dimension, passion, represents the ultimate expression of emotional attachment. A passionate customer uses expressions like, it's irreplaceable and it's a perfect fit for me, to describe his or her relationship with your company. For these customers, the number of potential alternatives they'd consider using is zero. Passionate consumers look to your company to set the standard for other companies to follow. These customers are relatively rare. They make up only 18% of all customers in Gallup's customer database, but they represent the zenith of customer connectedness. They are customers for life and are a significant financial resource and annuity for companies. A functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI machine, measures the flow of oxygenated blood to various parts of the brain on the assumption that greater activity in a particular brain area increases the need for oxygen in that area. Because they tend to show up as bright colors on the resulting brain scan images, the areas with increased blood flow are often described as lighting up. Areas that light up are experiencing intense neural activity. So imagine that you could peek inside the heads of your customers as they think about your company or your product, services, or brands. What would they see? Would the brain activity of customers with a strong emotional connection to your company vary from that of customers who are indifferent? To find an answer, researchers recently used fMRI to examine real-time brain activity in customers of a Japanese luxury retailer. When they analyzed the results of the brain scans, they found the brains of customers who were highly engaged with the retailer were more active while they were thinking about the company than were the brains of customers with lower levels of engagement. They also found that the brains of customers who were most passionate about the retailer were considerably more active while thinking about the luxury retailer than were the brains of customers with lower levels of passion. When they think about a company, customers who are highly engaged and the subset of those customers who are strongly passionate about the company engage a specific set of brain regions associated with emotional processing and storing emotional memories, as well as areas related to facial recognition and facial memory. This provides strong evidence that the emotional centers of the brain, as evidenced by neural activity, play a crucial role in building and sustaining customer engagement. 
New York University professor Baruch Lev has written extensively about intangible assets and how to account for their contributions to company market value. His research has found that intangible assets contribute much of the value in most firms and that the earnings generated by intangible assets are a better predictor of stock market returns than either accounting earnings or cash flows. Researchers have found that engaged employees are the main source of much of these intangible assets. When employees are engaged or emotionally and psychologically committed to the firm, businesses perform more efficiently, and when businesses perform more efficiently, employees become even more engaged. Here are four things to remember. Manage by outcomes, not behaviors. Liberate, don't legislate. Engagement is for everyone, and all politics is local. Employee engagement provides a starting point for improving organizational performance. Like politics, all performance is local, and it varies from location to location and team to team within the same organization. Addressing that variation and its impact on overall organizational health is the key to managing your organization's human sigma. This brings us to the third new rule of human sigma management. Rule three. Think globally, measure actions locally. You must measure and manage the employee-customer encounter locally. Do your current performance metrics go deep enough into your organization to provide local managers with the information they need to manage effectively? Employee engagement has a direct and measurable relationship to and impact on customer engagement. But like the ways in which heart rate and respiration interact to speed life-giving oxygen to all parts of the human body, the ways in which these organizational functions interact to enhance a company's financial vigor are more complex than a simple linear chain of factors. Integrating the vital signs of employee and customer engagement into a single performance construct supported by a single performance measure, the human sigma metric. Provides a comprehensive means to capture and understand this dynamic system. This is because the combined impact of a company's human systems taken together is substantially greater than the effects of the individual systems separately. This brings us to the next new rule of human sigma management. Rule four: There is one number you need to know. We can quantify and summarize the effectiveness of the employee-customer encounter in a single performance metric. The human sigma metric that is powerfully related to financial performance. Human sigma's strategic objective is to optimize the vital signs of your company's human systems. Human sigma optimizes these vital signs by focusing on performance and change on two levels within the company: the enterprise level, think globally, and the local level. Act locally. This two-pronged approach requires a system owner for each of the critical human systems, employees and customers, paired with an effective change mechanism that can be driven down to the team level where the employee-customer encounter occurs and where real sustainable change actually happens. These system owners should be coordinated by and partnered with a corporate human sigma champion charged with ensuring that these two dynamic systems are energized and optimized. Consolidate responsibility for managing your company's human systems under an executive champion, a chief human sigma officer, who has corporate support for broad-based change initiatives to improve human sigma performance. This individual must have a span of control that, at a minimum, extends to the customer and employee domains. Achieving and maintaining excellence in human systems performance demands regular attention to three interrelated activities: evaluation, intervention, and encouragement. Meeting all of these demands, but particularly the demand for intervention, requires attention to a combination of transactional and transformational activities. Transactional activities, such as periodic measurement and internal assessments, are those that recur regularly, but they tend to be more topical and short-term in focus. Transformational activities, in contrast, result in fundamental changes in the company's human ecosystem. They address questions such as: Do we have the right people in the right roles? Are our compensation and reward systems properly aligned with our strategic objectives? With that. We arrive at the fifth and final new rule of human sigma management. Rule five: 
If you pray for potatoes, you better grab the right hoe. Improvement in local human sigma performance requires deliberate and active intervention through attention to a combination of transactional and transformational intervention activities. Human Sigma focuses on accepting our human nature and capitalizing on it to manage employees, motivate them, accelerate their development, and unleash innovation and productivity, all to ultimately engage the emotions of your most valuable asset, your customers. The most important thing is to get started and keep working at it. Improvement takes time and mindful attention to the everyday facts of our lives. Each team needs to sketch out a vision for its future and work hard to build toward that vision. You'll make mistakes, so your system needs to be tolerant of missteps if your organization hopes to optimize its performance for the long haul. There are no silver bullets, no magical levers to pull, and no mystical pills to swallow that will instantly solve all of your company's challenges. Managing the employee-customer encounter is just plain hard work. It involves measuring the right things in the right ways, taking deliberate and disciplined action to improve each local team's performance, and celebrating your successes. However, when approached correctly, all of this hard work can really pay off. What works best for your organization must ultimately be determined by the employees who work there. The answers are not easy, and some organizations can find this frustrating. But researchers have also noticed how the need to own your own improvement makes people more innovative, productive, and confident. There's not a better set of characteristics for companies facing an unknown future.